Hello, and welcome to the latest presentation of the Friends of History First Wednesday Lecture Series. I'm Kathleen Daggett with the Friends of History, and I will be your host today. These monthly lectures are provided free of charge by the Friends of History of the New Mexico History Museum. We do, however, accept and encourage donations. Your contributions directly support the lecture series and more importantly, programs and exhibits at the New Mexico History Museum. Should you wish, wish to give a gift, any amount is appreciated, please go to our website and click on the donate button at the top of the page. Our speaker today is Janet Farrell Brody, Professor Emerita of U.S. History at Claremont Graduate University in California and author of the recently published book, The First Atomic Bomb, The Trinity Site in New Mexico. Professor Farrell Brody was a, will be speaking about the material in her new book, focusing on that first atomic test at the Trinity Site in the Telarosa Basin in South Central New Mexico, just weeks before the bombing in Japan that brought about the end of World War II. Her work explores the history of the Trinity test and its complicated aftermath, as well as the everyday experiences of the ordinary men and women who contributed to its success, the people who built and worked at the site, along with the ranchers whose land became the test site. Professor Bar Farrell Brody recently retired after 25 years as a professor at Claremont Graduate University. Her focus has been on researching, writing, and teaching about secrecy and American wars. She has published articles on atomic secrecy in multiple venues, including the Journal of Social History and the Journal of Diplomatic History. And now let's welcome Professor Janet Farrell Brody. Well, I'm very grateful for the chance to give this talk. And I especially want to thank Kathleen Daggett and the Friends of History of the New Mexico History Museum for the invitation. And thanks also to Grant Taylor for the help with the videotaping. Um, in mid-July, 1945, just before dawn, after a terrible rainstorm with thunder and lightning at a remote and secret site in the New Mexico desert that was part of a guarded and isolated army gunnery range, men who had worked for months successfully exploded the world's first atomic bomb. It's almost trite to repeat the fact that the world was never the same. My book about the bomb and that test, the Trinity test, was published a few months ago. Several earlier scholars have written about that test and their books are important and still valuable. But my focus takes a different turn than those earlier works. I do not look in any detail at the scientific aspects of the creation of the bomb or at the famous and about to be famous scientists who uh, were part of the bomb project. Instead, my book looks at the far less known people involved in building and guarding the test site. It pays attention to the drafted men in the Army's newly created Special Expeditionary Detachment, the SEDs, and those in the newly created provisional uh, expeditionary detachment, the PEDs. It also pays attention to the military police who guarded the site and the other generally unnamed workers who made living a living who made living and working on the site possible, in spite of the terrible extremes of heat and cold and wind, the lack of water, and the requirements of absolute secrecy. I've also looked into other aspects of the Trinity test, such as the conflicts for decades after the test between the Army, the Air Force, the Atomic Energy Commission, and the U.S. Park Service over who would have access to the site and celebrate the site. The U.S. Park Service spent decades trying to preserve the site as a national park, but when that failed, they wanted to commemorate it as an official historical site. The Trinity site carries many meanings, some deeply contested. To many, it signifies American scientific brilliance, national prestige, military might, the place where the bomb that ended World War I was first successfully tested. To others, the tourists who flock to the site in the open house the army permits once or twice a year, the site is puzzling for its barrenness. Nothing remains of the test or its meanings except the desert landscape, a fence around the central area 
and an obelisk raised by the army. The site also carries painful reminders of American officials ignoring the health effects of the bomb on surrounding citizenry. The Trinity site reminds us of a time and place where America released, unleashed the world's first atomic bomb on itself. There are many ironies connected to the history of the, of the Trinity site. One is, it's, is the startling reminder of the incredibly short span of time between one historical era and another. Only 63 years separate the Trinity test from one of the last battles of the Southwest's Indian Wars. The Battle of Hembrio between the Apache and the US Army occurred only 63 years before the dawn of the nuclear age. Another irony of the history of the Trinity bomb site is that the first group of military guards who came on horseback, their horse mounted unit included in its history, the US Cavalry's defeat by the Sioux and the death of their leader, George Armstrong Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn. With their history as the first horse mounted military police outfit in the army, they brought 16 horses with them to Trinity. Although one official later recalled that the horses proved kind of useless and that once the trucks arrived, they were the horses were rarely used. It is worth underscoring that the first men to arrive at the site of the world's first atomic test included a stable sergeant, a blacksmith, a farrier, and a saddler. The earliest buildings at that site included a blacksmith shop, a hay barn, and stables for the horses. Another intriguing aspect of the history of the area is that some high-ranking Nazi scientists who were secretly brought to the US during and immediately after the war um, in what was labeled Operation Paperclip were housed near the Trinity site. Most of those German scientists were later moved to the East Coast to work on the burgeoning US programs to develop missiles and rockets. Some of those ex-Nazis appear to have aided in the small and very quiet US programs in biological and chemical warfare. Whether any of them actually witnessed this, the Trinity test remains to be ferreted out. Before getting into the substance of my talk, I would like to show a few photographs um, of the text since visual materials are so compelling as historical sources. So the first slide begins, the slideshow begins with this first slide, which is of the devastation at Nagasaki in Japan. Uh, Nagasaki was destroyed by the plutonium bomb that was was developed at tr the Trinity site. There are scores of photographs of the Trinity test, some in color. The scientists organizing the test had uh, many photographers and they are well known. This is an early, um, an early shot, just 16 seconds into the test. I have not included a lot of the other photographs of the actual um, detonation because they're so well known and they're so easy to find. I wanted to show a few um, shots of the Trinity landscape. Um, it's to some barren and desolate and to others very beautiful, but this is um, a, a rather typical photo. And again, here is a desert landscape with cloud cover and some trucks going along one of the roads constructed for the Trinity test, very dusty. I'll talk later in, in my talk about the ranchers who were evicted, but um, from the, the, the test site area, the army made use of some of their water tanks and some of their other materials. Um, this is an old water tank being taken to the Trinity site. The Trinity base camp um, 
and very primitive construction. Some of the, um, the housing came from the civilian conservation corps camps of the, the New Deal. Um, notice the windmill in the foreground, water was a constant issue, not enough of it, and it was brackish and undrinkable. Men didn't even want to bathe in it. So um, this is jumbo being taken to the test site. There was early concern among the scientists that the, plut that the, the test would fizzle, that the plutonium would be lost. And they, for a while, thought of doing the test within this giant container. Um, eventually, they scrapped that idea. But this is jumbo being taken to the test site. I will talk um, a bit later about the May test, a preliminary to the Trinity, actual Trinity test. And this was the um, early construction of that quite significant test. Again, here are the men standing, uh, the men who helped build the, the structure for the May test, um, standing in celebration before it exploded. Again. Um, the, the structure for the May test. Um, it's very significant. It's not discussed widely in the literature. So um, I wanted to focus on it a bit. These next few slides show uh, are photographs of the debris after the test, the, the destruction created from the Trinity bomb. This is one of the bunkers and um, that several bunkers were set up for um, official equipment and scientists to study um, all manner of, of, of the experiments, but afterwards much was in complete disarray. These bunkers were preserved at the Trinity site for, for a number of years before the army decided they were dangerous and, and destroyed them. But you can see the, just the amount of debris from the test. Yes, this is very small, but it's the debris in the desert surrounding the Trinity site after, after the test. Again, a ruined bunker, um, unknown soldier exploring the, the contents. In the bulk of the rest of this talk, I want to focus on two particular issues. First, I want to delve into some of the long, contentious, um, sometimes violent past in the Tularosa Valley, the area surrounding the Trinity site. And second, I want to talk about the radiation from the test. This is a highly significant historical issue, and it has grown even more um, significant in recent months, in recent weeks. Um, so the past of the site. Um, to many modern eyes, the desert around the Trinity site appears to be barren and desolate, although to others it has considerable beauty. Whatever one's judgment, it appears to be a vast and unpeopled expanse. And it is indeed, indeed unpeopled today because it is located in a small section of the largest military base in North America, the White Sands Missile Range, which is very carefully guarded against intruders. In earlier centuries, however, Native American groups traversed this area of the Tularosa Basin. They gathered plants, occasionally they settled briefly. There were long periods of peace, and there were also periods of conflict. The seeming, tra seeming tranquility today belies a history that includes centuries of volatility, violence, and human dispossession. Among the tribal groups whose histories are part of this area, we should note the Utes, the many Apache groups, such as the Palomas, the Coatelejos, the Sierra Biancas, the Picarelos, the Pelones, the Lipons, and of course the Comanche, who successfully challenged the Apache Empire in the mid to late 19th century and created their own vast 
and powerful empire. By the mid 1800s, other groups, non-native began to use or to try to use these lands. Mexican men and their families came north to mine the precious ore, to raise goats, to raise cattle. Anglo settlers and miners also arrived, especially after the US Army forced many of the native groups onto reservations and had jailed or killed their military leaders. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, parts of New Mexico were a very decidedly multicultural world. When I started researching the Baca family, who were among the people contesting the loss of their, of their ranch land to the US military during the war, the 1920 census for the small town of Socorro, the then small town of Socorro, showed the Baca neighbors coming from Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Texas, Kentucky, Missouri, California, Canada, Scotland, and Germany. In the 1940s, there were some 100 to 120 ranches in the Tularosa Valley in and around the Trinity site. The ranches differed from our stereotypes of, the, of Western ranches gained from movies and, and fiction. A single ranch might be in different parts of the state um, rather than being located in one specific spot. Water was scarce and a precious commodity. So ranchers sought land where they could graze their, their, their animals, often on parcels many miles apart, even though it was technically one ranch. In the early 1940s, with the war in Europe underway, the US military began to take over ranches in New Mexico, evicting families um, to create Army and Navy Air Force bases. When the U.S. officially entered the war after Pearl Harbor, many more ranchers were evicted. Ranchers reported later that they had been assured by U.S. officials that they would be allowed to return to their properties after the war. But in the meantime, they had to hastily abandon their homes, their equipment, and find new places for their families to live and their livestock to be pastured. The ranchers obeyed the orders to leave their ranches. They considered themselves loyal, patriotic Americans who supported the war. Some of them had sons already fighting in the war in Europe. They trusted officials' assurances that everything left behind, their homes, windmills, fences, barns, and equipment would be cared for. Their main complaint centered on the speed with which they were required to leave and the problems of finding pasturage for their livestock. Um, the bitterness and lawsuits came after the war because the United States military expanded its holdings in the area and forced ranchers to continue to lease or to sell their properties. Then came a deep blow in 1970 when the army told the US I'm sorry, the New Mexico ranchers, that it needed the land for expanded and permanent military bases. The ranchers, shocked by the forced sale, were also angered, even appalled, by the payment the government offered them. The government estimated the worth of their ranches without including the grazing leased land. Ranchers throughout the West paid the government to lease federal and state lands for their herds. And um, the leases, leases were calculated as the total worth of the ranch in the rancher's eyes. To the military, the land was simply rented to the ranchers, but remained owned by the government. The ranchers said, we pay taxes, federal and state, on our grazing leased land, as well as what we outright own. We also pay death and inheritance taxes on the grazing lands. So this is a lot of detail and a lot of complexity, but it's a crucial part of the, the modern history of the Trinity site area. The disagreements between the ranchers and the US military and the government lasted for decades. It's a history of forced evictions, 
of numerous lawsuits and other legal battles and of two separate congressional hearings. The records of these battles constitute very valuable historical sources of information about the lives and, an and actions of the ranching people in the Atomic West. The White Sands ranchers' protests about the loss of their lands to the military can also be considered a kind of precursor to the sagebrush rebellions of the later 20th and early 21st centuries that um, in which contested groups uh, with diverse, in which groups with diverse political leanings fought in peaceful and non-peaceful ways to, um, uh, to uh, contest the state and federal comp uh, compensation and take taking of their lands. Land contestation in New Mexico's Tularosa Valley can be seen as a microcosm of centuries of conflict over land elsewhere in the West. Um, I would like now to turn to um, the aspects of the Trinity's radiation and its legacies. Um, the radioactive fallout from the Trinity test has been studied for decades and today garners a considerable amount of attention and controversy. The scientists who theorized the Trinity test anticipated that there would be some radioactive fallout. For many re but for many reasons, especially the pressures of the war, there's no evidence that anyone was overly worried or paid special attention to this issue. The most alarmed memos did not circulate beyond a few very key officials. At the time, this was not really because of deliberate censorship, although of course there was a lot of censorship and secrecy surrounding the whole Manhattan Project. But the lack of attention to the fallout memos was the result of the frenetic pace of the test and the, um, just the, the, the busyness of preparing for the test. Kenneth Bainbridge, who was in charge of the overall test, wrote later that men worked 18 to 20 hours a day in a frenzied pace that left little time for reflection about other possible problems. The various areas that were originally considered for the Trinity test underscore how little Manhattan Project officials at the time thought about the possibilities of fallout. The prevailing winds from several of the sites that were under consideration blew toward populated areas, but the men choosing the site did not seem to have taken any of this into consideration. One idea for the test site was a small island of San Nicolas, which is about 69 miles in the Pacific Ocean outside of Los Angeles. The prevailing wind in the summer from San Nicolas would have blown radioactive um, fallout straight to Los Angeles. Um, other reasons were made for the, the not choosing San Nicolas Island. It was too far, it was, it was too far by sea, um, too far from Los Alamos. The prevailing Another uh, another site that was considered for the test was Grants, New Mexico. The prevailing wind pattern from Grants in July and August is that toward, would have blown a radioactive cloud toward the Navajo lands around Farmington and Shiprock, New Mexico. Um, but that too was 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 disregarded for for other reasons. An official Manhattan district history notes that the choice of what was eventually selected as the Trinity site was made at a time when everyone believed that the nearest habitation was 12 miles away and the nearest town was 27 miles away. That for momentous, for numerous nearby ranchers turned out not to be the case, but very poor maps and the little detailed foot investigation 
that men were able to make before the test um, meant that that there was not a lot of uh, recognition at the time of how many New Mexicans were within fallout range. I want to add that I want to add here just briefly my praise for um, an impressive research project um, that was funded by the Center for Disease Control in 2010. It was called the Los Alamos Historical Document Retrieval and Assessment Project, LADRA. The materials they gathered are available in New Mexico libraries and the work involved not just extraordinary research, but um, some very important um, and original mappings of the 10 mile, 20 mile, 30 mile radiuses around the Trinity site and who was living there. Two months before the actual Trinity test, scientists conducted a preliminary test at the Trinity site. It was intended as a preparatory drill, a kind of shakedown test before the actual event. They called it the May test or the 100 ton test because 100 tons of high explosives were stacked into a wooden platform, a small power, power to be detonated. Workers threaded those explosives with a small amount of the very precious plutonium sent with great care from the Manhattan Project's plutonium plant in Hanford, Washington. The preliminary test coincided accidentally with the end of the war in Europe. And it also turned out to be the single largest explosive event up to that time in history. The officials in charge were pleased that it went well, even though there were a few glitches and um, men were not in places they weren't supposed to be. There was no real time to reflect um, deeply on some of the surprises from that test, especially the radioactive fallout. That fallout was quite minimal. And it did not arouse alarm, although some aspects in retrospect should have. Scientists wanted better understanding of the explosive power of the bomb, its yield. And the best way to determine that yield was to measure the fission products in the soil after the blast. They were extremely surprised to discover that in shifting I'm sorry, in sifting the dirt picked up around the crater, the finest particles were three times more radioactive than the larger ones. This should have raised some alarm given the windstorms that swept through the New Mexico area, including around the test site. If the finer grained soil, the dust, following a nuclear explosion proved to be especially radioactive, the implications about the spread of radio radio radiation far from the test site in windblown New Mexico were serious. But such worries remained very little publicized, only voiced quietly among a few of the scientists. The general discoveries from the May test were reassuring to everyone concerned. There was, of course, a lot of official attention to and concern about the radiation from the test. Um, and this was factored into early discussions about the test and into decisions about where shelters were to be built for this, to house the scientific instruments and to place the scientists at the time of the test. Radiation measuring instruments were quietly set up around the state in the days before the test. Those instruments, however, were for the scientific records rather than official concerns about radiation raining down on local populations. Those instruments were meant for later scientific analysis for science. They were not set up because officials worried about the test's radioactivity and local populations. Hours before the test, emergency evacuation teams were quietly sent outside towns near the test test site. Um, this was all planned ahead of time, but a little bit late in the planning process. To me, a historian, to me as a historian assessing 
those preparations, they seem inadequate. The number of men assigned to the emergency evacuation teams, and especially the number of vehicles that were available to help citizens escape in an emergency would simply not have been sufficient. Um, if a radioactive cloud had settled over any of the nearby towns, it was very good fortune for the Trinity test officials that radioactive, the radioactive cloud did not settle over any of those towns, although it did dissipate and drift um, over large expanses of the state. After Trinity, a small area of what looked like green or blue glass, some of it was red, appeared beneath the test tower um, that extended for several hundred yards in a saucer-like depression. Um, scientists still debate what created that, that uh, lake of green glass, although in 2000, Six, a study by two Los Alamos scientists urged that the glass, actually argued that the glass came from the plutonium from the bomb. At first, officials called the glass atomsite, and then they later renamed it trinitite. Over the years, some of the trinitite disappeared from the area, but the records of what happened to it are, are muddled and confusing. Workers at the Trinity site and later tourists took some Trinitite as souvenirs, sometimes making it into jewelry. In the late 1960s, much Trinitite still remained at the site. And one report noted that a person visiting the site would probably be able to gather as much as one kilogram in less than an hour. At a certain point, army personnel put much of the Trinitite into dozens of barrels that were then stored in the remaining bunkers at the site. When the army and Los Alamos officials excavated those bunkers in 1967, they were surprised to find the Trinitite barrels. Then they assessed them and quietly moved them to Los Alamos. I have found no evidence of what happened to those barrels after their removal to Los Alamos. After the decades since the 19, over the decades since the 1945 test, many groups of scientists from numerous institutions investigated the radioactivity from the Trinity test and wrote reports about it. They may have produced as many as 40 different studies. I've read as many of those studies as I've been able to locate and gain access to, but I've really only seen a handful. Some of the studies were probably labeled top secret, which makes them especially hard to obtain. Other studies though, especially those conducted by the Atomic Energy Project at UCLA, became part of what is called the gray literature in science, in the scientific world. That label applies to publications that never saw wide circulation or publicity because although they weren't officially labeled secret or top secret, they were just simply quietly shelved away, protected from publicity and much scrutiny. What we do know from the available surrounding study, sur I'm sorry, surviving studies, at least the ones that I've been able to see about the Trinity fallout. The Trinity fallout seems to have been um, unexpectedly and surprising in many ways. The Trinity test was of course the first actual atomic explosion. So all expectations and predictions um, were based on theoretical models. Once the Nevada test site was opened in 1951, and it, and it became the site of many above ground atomic tests. And following the atomic tests in the Pacific, scientists began to study fallout, a, a new phenomenon, much more, more seriously and, um, and carefully. The early studies of the Trinity fallout startled scientists. They learned that the Trinity fallout had not traveled in predictable ways or patterns, and that it did not disappear in predictable ways. The fallout was not necessarily stronger nearer the test, 
site, near the test site. Scientists discovered later what came to be recognized as patterns of skip. Um, that is, radioactivity might be measured in high doses in small areas far from the test site and carried by on unexpected and, and uncharted wind patterns. Some of the Trinity fallout studies conducted in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s found continuing radioactivity, even at high levels, in soil, plants, and desert animals far removed from the test site. Some of the surveys found not only persistent levels, but also increase, increasing levels of radioactivity. A 1957 report stated that the area originally contaminated by fallout from the Trinity test was greater than 1,100 square miles that had been estimated in the 1948 study. In fact, the 1957 study determined that there had been no appreciable in decrease in plutonium in the soils over the 12 years since the test. Experts disagreed often vehemently with each other about these reports. Sometimes personnel within the same institutions came up with conflicting findings. This often had to do as much with the, the novelty and the complexity of studying radioactive fallout in non-laboratory, occasionally challenging outdoor conditions as, as it did with political difference between those officials supporting atomic testing and those more opposed to it. My point is that there were many studies conducted about the Trinity tests radiation, but few received much attention and their conclusions have had little effect, however important their data seems to, to have been. And this brings me to uh, a final and one of the crucial issues of the Trinity test, the radioactive effects on local populations. Um, the history of official U.S. governmental responses to America's nuclear test downwinders is a troubled one. They, there are very good, very detailed histories of the effects of people, of the efforts of people affected by radiation from the Nevada tests to secure legal redress for their livestock losses and their health problems. Those Americans found little legal success in the early years. Judges dismissed their lawsuits without coming to trial. A few cases that did come to trial um, failed to convince juries. However, after passage of some relatively weak bills attempting restitution in the 1970s, the pendulum swung slightly more in favor of downwinders claims, particularly with the passage in 1990 of what was called the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, the RECA Act. Under RECA, some of the families living in specified areas downwind of the Nevada tests began to find new pathways to obtain legal recompense for their medical bills and hospital expenses. However, Congress very carefully specified what states, what counties, what sections of states uh, people were eligible. The new law did not extend to inhabitants of New Mexico. It took many more years until New Mexico citizens were allowed to apply for compensation for radiation exposure from nuclear tests. But even then, the Trinity test was not included among the atomic tests for which compensation could be sought. In other later proposed congressional legislation, Trinity downwinders were included, but those bills disappeared into the mysterious legislative silences of congressional committees. It remains perplexing why the Trinity downwinders have been excluded from seeking compensation. When Congress eventually amended the original RECA Act to allow people who worked at the Trinity site 
to apply for health compensation for health problems. The bill still ignored the wider Trinity state, Trinity downwinders. Congress has yet to, to act on expanding RECA to all Trinity downwinders. At this point, the New Mexico downwinders from the Trinity test have received no, no formal compensation or even an acknowledgement of the health sacrifices they made for the good of the nation. In spite of publicity and challenges from citizens and in spite of the growth of important organizations such as the Tula Rosa Basin Downwinders Consortium, advocating, inclu advocating inclusion of the Trinity test downwinders to date they continue to be overlooked in federal compensation programs. Why this has not happened is a mystery. And I hope that someone more skilled than I at penetrating the mysteries and secrets of congressional records may be able to, um, to explain it soon. Perhaps President Biden's recent visit to uh, and support for the Trinity Downwinders will have some significant legislative impact, we shall see. In conclusion, the Trinity test has not become simply an historical event to be celebrated or remembered with mixed emotion. Its legacies live on today, especially in the continuing controversies about the bomb's radiation. I conclude this talk with a quotation from Japanese documentary filmmaker Yoshihiko Muraki, who came to a new realization after visiting the Trinity site. He came to believe, and I, I quote him here, that by looking at the atomic bomb from July 16, instead of August 6, one can grasp the complexities of the bomb from a different angle. To Muraki, the Trinity site was the first transformation of the world. The second transformation occurred at Hiroshima and the third at Nagasaki. Thus, the bomb dropped in the New Mexico desert and the two dropped on the two Japanese cities created a new kind of trinity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Janet for speaking with us today about the Trinity site. That was very informative, great details. Love the background information all the way back to the horse soldiers. That was that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so uh, this is, how did you pick this topic? So, I mean, there's a lot on the Trinity site, but then you, you've you taken a different angle in all this. How did you get to, how did you get to hit this? Well, I was actually approached by a colleague, a Pomona historian, Char Miller, who has a series. And he, he said, would I be interested in doing something on the Trinity test? And I was having real problems with another book I, I was writing. I just wanted to be rid of it. And I <laughs> was so thrilled about this new project. Um, I love doing historical research and, um, and this seemed important. And it seemed doable. Char thought it would take me, I think, a year. It took me five, <laughs> but that's that's what started it. So, you, you talked about there being um, more research and, and more studies to look into here. Um, what are some of that potential stuff? And and I'm going to say, and are you headed that way? I'm not headed that <laughs> way. I hope that um, others will be. Um, I was disappointed that I didn't have the time in the end to really do more deep investigation into the workers. There were two construction companies that were hired to build, erect the buildings for the test, um, for people to live in, the scientists to live in, the tests to be conducted at, at Trinity. I think that a, a diligent researcher could find some material about, I think, Mexican-American, Hispanic workers from those companies who were out there in the horrific climate, um, nailing, sawing, building, building the site. Um, I think there is, um, yeah, I, I, there's, that would be a, a, a very exciting um, project. Um, 
So, um, you mentioned uh, grants, New Mexico possibly being a spot. A spot. My understanding is the Manhattan Project team were told to um, to not displace any native peoples um, as as they were selecting sites, and and ideally not to. Um, well, I guess fallout was a new concept, but but not to put them in into at risk. Was that a case, and and did it work? Did did we avoid um, the tribal lands? Yes, um, the the wife of the Secretary of the in Interior um, was a a scholar of uh, I think I think it was the Navajo. She wrote books. She spoke the language. She um, and she told her husband, and then he told Grant he told um, Groves, no Native Americans were to be displaced for the Trinity test. Um, Native tribes were, of course, displaced for by Hanford, the, the creation of Hanford, the plutonium site. They were later seriously affected by the Nevada test site bombings. But um, the choice uh, of the Trinity site, they, they honored what um, Secretary of the Interior told them to do. Good. <laughs> So I'm I'm going to have to ask you. Obviously, that the movie Oppenheimer is is out this summer and has brought renewed attention to this whole space. I think more at the um, upper named people level um, rather than necessarily the the lesser known folks. But um, do you think any of that's going to bring more attention to to some of these stories? Maybe to the downwinders. Light I or... hope so. I certainly hope so. It, it was a very good movie. I thought the part about the Trinity test was very well done. Um, uh, yeah. Um, but, and I hope it brings attention to the whole test, to the whole phenomenon. Um, uh, I mean, it was mostly about um, Oppenheimer <laughs> and Groves, <laughs> but, but still, um, there's I believe there's a, a series coming out in the fall, a, a um, public television series on the whole Manhattan Project. And um, and then there are some really older, really great um, documentaries about the Trinity test. So all the attention is good. Right. Well, hopefully. Well, well, this lecture is, is pre-recorded, so our, our audience is not able to ask you any questions. But so uh, can audience members uh, perhaps send you an email if they have follow up questions? I would be delighted. I would be delighted to hear from anyone. And um, I will urge them. I will urge some people to continue researching and do more historical work. Um, Excellent. You obviously you just uh, released this book, and the reviews of the books have been very favorable. I've been you know, surfing on the internet and noting that it's it was meticulously researched and compelling and sensitive to the people of New Mexico. So, um, where could where can somebody get your book? Oh well, I I hope it's available in bookstores. It's um, I I always support real bookstores. Um, I've been trying to tell bookstores about its existence. Um, they could ask for it in a bookstore and ask that it be, be sent. Um, they could get it from the publisher, uh, University of Nebraska Press. Um, they could get it on Amazon, although I like real bookstores, so. Um, <laughs> or at least uh, Nebraska Press, that sounds like the, the answer, yes. all right. right. Yes, yes. Thank you. Well, do you have any uh, last comments before we wrap up and call I, I just am extremely thankful and grateful to have been asked to do this. It, it um, made me go back and <laughs> reread my chapters, which was at times a little horrifying. But um, it's such a beautiful part of the state of New Mexico. And I hope that the Army does reopen the site twice a year, which for a while they did, and then for a while they shut it down to once a year. It's really worth going to see the site, even though it's um, there's not a whole lot there. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, thank you again, Janet. This thank has you. been excellent. Thank Thanks you very much. This.
And for our audience, in closing, a reminder to visit our website at friendsofhistorynm.org, where you can rewatch this lecture and any other Friends of History First Wednesday lectures. Click on the lecture series link at the top of the page, then past lectures to see the list. If you wish to learn more about upcoming lectures or about the Friends of History, we encourage you to join our mailing list or email us at nmhmfriendsofhistory at gmail.com. Finally, we request that you consider making a donation to the Friends of History, no matter the size, through our website so that the Friends of History can continue to support programs at the New Mexico History Museum. And thank you to all of you who have been contributing to the Friends of History. We look forward to seeing you in all the coming months. Thank you and goodbye.